Lord, today we celebrate the first Sunday in Advent, a time of the year when we celebrate you and the wonders that you have done in our lives through the birth of your son Jesus and his sacrifice for our sins. Help us to see today as a day when we can sit still for a few moments, sing songs of your praise and feel your spirit within us. No matter what befell us over the Thanksgiving holidays, good or ill, help us to see that today is another day and we have a purpose in you and your will for us. What is your will for us, O oh Lord? What will you have us to do this holiday season? Search us, know us, help us to be made new and to see our purpose for you and your church this Advent season. And we pray this prayer the way that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. You guys, get your cameras out. Take a picture. They're ready for a. They're ready for a postcard, I guess. How are you guys doing today? You good? You guys look like you're ready for Christmas already. It's like the first day of December. They know it's. They know it's coming. And which is good because we're going to talk about that. So, you guys, it's it's a special day today. It is the first day of December, which means today it's the first day of Advent. And you just heard the Clemens family, they just read about that. Miss Tanya just read about it being the first Sunday of Advent. And that means it's the countdown to Christmas. Are you guys excited? Yeah, you don't seem too excited. I don't know, maybe I'm more excited than you guys. I'm excited, I don't even get lots of presents for Christmas. I bet you guys get a whole lot more than I do. So yeah, she's, yeah. All right, so there are so many things we do to get ready for Christmas. What do you guys do to get ready for Christmas? You guys do anything to get ready for Christmas? What do you do? You put three Christmas trees up, wow. What else do you do, Gaines, what do you do? Awesome, so they're gonna have two good trees. So what do you guys put on those Christmas trees? What do you put on them? You put some ornaments, Bella put some ornaments. Do you guys put lights on your Christmas tree? Yeah, so we put lights, and we, because we put up our trees, we put on lights, we put up ornaments, and we probably mail out Christmas cards to our friends and family, and we probably go shopping for Christmas presents, and then we have to wrap those Christmas presents, and, and we travel, gosh, we do so much to get ready for Christmas, and sometimes we get so involved in getting ready for Christmas that sometimes we forget about the real reason for Christmas, which is what? Yeah, sometimes we just need to hang out with our family and have fun. And remember that we're getting ready. We're preparing for what else during Christmas time? I don't know. You guys, help him out. What are we really preparing for at Christmas time? Jesus' birth. Jesus' birth. That's right. There you go, Belly. We're talking right with him. So we're getting ready for Christmas, but we're preparing for the promise of Jesus' birth. You guys, so while today's the first day of Advent and the first day of our countdown to Christmas, I want you guys to remember too, and I'm really quite positive with this group right here, that you guys are also going to remember that we're preparing for the countdown to Jesus' birth, okay? Now, we don't know, um, we're also preparing for him to come again, and we don't know when that's going to happen, but every year what's so exciting is that we get to December, and we get to get ready for Jesus' birth again, and we get to get excited that one day Jesus is going to come again. So... While you're getting ready for Christmas and getting those trees up, I know Belle already has one or two up because I've seen them on Facebook. Um, I want you guys to remember that we're getting ready for Jesus to come also. Are you guys excited about that? I'm excited. I can see by the smile on your faces. All right. So let's pray, you guys. Dear God, thank you for the season. Thank you for the love you give us. 
help us to give that love back to all the people around us. Amen. All right, you guys have fun at Little Church. Let's stand and sing. Our sermon text this morning comes from Isaiah chapter 2, verses 1 through 5. This is what Isaiah saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of the mountains. It will be lifted above the hills, people will stream to it. Many nations will go and say, come, let's go up to the Lord's mountain, to the house of Jacob's God, so that he may teach us his ways and we may walk in God's paths. Instruction will come from Zion, the Lord's word from Jerusalem. God will judge between the nations and settle disputes of mighty nations. Then they will beat their swords into iron plows and their spears into pruning tools. Nation will not take up sword against nation. They will no longer learn how to make war. Come, house of Jacob, let's walk by the Lord's light. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
want to be too tall this morning. Um, as way of apology, my stole, this is my Advent stole and my Easter stole, and I've had the opportunity to travel to some third world countries with um, the United Methodist Volunteers in Mission, and um, when I saw this one in the Cokesbury catalog, it reminded me of Ecuador and Panama, and so um, against my uh, family's advice, this is the one that I asked for as a gift, and so... Um, it's a little non-traditional, but it reminds me of some of the places I've traveled. So today's uh, scripture is from Isaiah, and it is about, um, Isaiah sees the coming of Christ as a real time to come. It is, this is a prophecy, and this is a prophecy for peace. It's not wishful thinking, and it's not poetry. This is real biblical truth, that there will one day be total peace. We have to see Isaiah's prophecy as hope for the world, real hope, as we light the candle of hope today. Without it, we'll be regulated to mad depression. I mean, think about what life would be like if we did not have the hope of Christ, if we didn't come to church on Sunday if we didn't have something bigger to live for than Black Friday. <laughs> this is where we have to view biblical writing as truth and scripture as primary in our Christian lives. In our Wesleyan tradition, we have, um, we have the, what some scholars have called the Wesleyan quadrilateral, Albert Outler. He says we have scripture, tradi tradition, reason, and experience. But without scripture, the rest of it is lost. So today we turn to the book of Isaiah, and we see today's scripture as primary. In verse 4 it says, Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. You know, the world stage is one place to look for people being disgruntled with one another. You know, we turn on the TV, we listen to the radio, we look at social media, and there's all kinds of stuff on there. But how about, you don't have to look too far, how about your own family? How many of us really did have a good Thanksgiving? It's a humbling question to ask yourself, isn't it? My life, like many of your lives, is splattered with ironies. I like to read all sorts of different things, and because of my dogs, Jack and BB, we have, to ha we have paid various fines on various types of books <laughs> at libraries where we have lived. Um, one of the books that Jack and BB have me reading now is A Human, The Mosquito, A Human History of Our Deadliest Predator by Timothy Wingard. Not only is it a history of the mosquito, but it's a concise history of the modern world and how the mosquito shaped battles and conquests because of the disease that was spread by humans and influenced many decisive battles and parts of human history. Wouldn't you know that we were reading the chapter on the Columbian Exchange this past Thursday and Friday where Wingard says, until recently, academics across various fields underestimated the potency of disease in reducing indigenous peoples in the Americas, thereby miscalculating the actual population prior to contact. Extremely low estimates eased the burden and guilt of colonization of the descendants of European settlers. Until the 1970s, school children were taught that most of the United States was vacant and summoning European settlement. After all, the alleged one million Indians did not need all this land that was yearning for American manifest destiny. It was prophesied that expansion was inevitable, justified, and ordained by divine providence. But it is now believed that Florida alone was home to almost one million indigenous inhabitants. Current estimates for the total indigenous population of the pre-Columbian United States hover around 12 to 15 million, accompanied by 60 million bison. That's a lot more than I was taught. <laughs> so Wingard is saying that the diseases that European settlers brought with them had a monumental effect. 
on the population in America. The largest wipeout of human life, even bigger than the Black Death, occurred in America and can be attributed to mosquito-borne illnesses and other events. So I was sitting there on the couch on Thanksgiving and thinking, that's interesting, you know, that we have this difficult history to contend with on Thanksgiving. For the 12 to 15 million indigenous persons in what we know now as the United States, our lives are complicated. I've had some of these conversations with y'all before about how complicated life is for various reasons. We have these diseases in spirit, in mind, in body, on personal levels, on communal levels, on national and world levels. No different from the Colombian world is the world that we live in today. And that is why we view scripture as truth. Because we live in such a difficult world, we have to have something that we turn to as truth. We have to have something that we turn to that is hope-giving, that is better than what we can give to ourselves. The Wesley Study Bible says, No matter how difficult the conditions and challenges to be faced, persons of biblical faith know that the day is coming when the Lord's reign will be established with Jerusalem at its center. Verse 3 of today's scripture says, All humanity will recognize the need for God's word. Peace will turn implements of war into tools of community. Verse 4. Isaiah is talking about peace among men, men meaning humanity, because we will use our free will to be at peace instead of being at war. We will walk together in harmony, but we ask ourselves, when will this be? Who will lead this charge? My friends, it is you and it is me. We are not waiting on Billy Graham to come back from the dead. We are waiting on ourselves to wake up. To wake up and to see that the time is today. The time has come. We have the ability to change our behaviors now. We live in the already but the not yet when the already has come in the birth of the Christ child and we are simply supposed to be behaving better. We're using our free will for the most part to act correctly. We're needing to act morally. We're needing to be upright and act with honesty. At this time of the Christmas season, a popular song written by Vince Gill and or Jill Jackson and Cy Miller, they have it right in their song, Let There Be Peace on Earth. But the moment has already come. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Let there be peace on earth, the peace that was meant to be. With God as our father, brothers, all are we. Let me walk with my brother in perfect harmony. Let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step I take, let this be my solemn vow. To take each moment, to live each moment in peace eternally. Let there be peace on earth and let it begin with me. Not in the future, but now. We need this biblical faith that the prophet Isaiah wrote so long ago. We need common faith. Faith that is not afraid to be strong. Faith that is not afraid to act in love. The prophet says, In the days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. The title of today's sermon is Above the Hills because, as George and I sat down and thought about it, we all know about the valleys of life that Psalm 23 talks about so eloquently. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. 
Now in Isaiah, we have it proclaimed that the mountain of the Lord's house will be raised above the hills. We don't have to trod through the valleys, going through good and bad. We are above that. We, on a, a, we are on a level plane. Your takeaway for today is that we are and always have been a people of hope and a people of peace. The time for that is now. It has come. In the season of Advent, we remember Jesus as a babe in the manger. We're not twirling around wondering what our mission is supposed to be. We are here. We are ready to act. And I know just like you that there are elements to this dream that are not in place yet. But that doesn't excuse us from acting the way that we know we should act. As Christians, when we know how to act, we are charged in acting in that correct manner. As we just walk through a whole month of stewardship, we know that we are supposed to come to that standard of 10% and possibly exceed it. So we are charged in acting correctly Peace will take a lot longer coming if we ignore correct behavior and the examples that we set for future generations. And so the way that we do the right thing is that we put God in the center of our lives, we put God in the center of our thinking, and we put God in the center of our planning. And then you become one person who has beat your sword into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks. And you know, you see lots of pictures of children hand in hand with their parents or their grandparents or their great grandparents if they are so fortunate. And you ask yourself, am I doing the right thing because who might follow you in your example of peace? You never know who's looking. And it's up to us to set that standard now. So let peace begin with me. Let this be the moment now. With every step you take this holiday season, know that God has come in the birth of Jesus. This is not something that we are waiting on. It's something that we live in. And this is a behavior that we are to have already. Let us pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this scripture from Isaiah, from the ancient prophet. Help us to see this as a time of the year when we live in the hope and that we live in the behaviors that we know are set forth for us. Future generations are watching, and they are watching us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Thank you for joining us this morning at First United Methodist Myrtle Beach. We are always delighted when you tune in and join us in worship and fellowship. If you would like to see this service in its entirety, check us out on our website or on our Facebook. Thank you for being with us today.